Hey guys, how you doing? I want to do a video on uh, vertex shaders and recalculating surface normals when you're perturbing a surface inside a vertex shader. And this is something that came up. Uh, a guy sent me an instant message on the Unity forums asking about an older project in shader that I had done. And in that case, there was a unit sphere that was being perturbed by a sine wave. Um, and it was able to calculate the normals nicely and look smooth and all of that. And you know, the, the problem is that, of course, that trick relied on it being a unit sphere. There were some some tricks being done because what when you're rebuilding the normals, you, you kind of have to implicitly be able to generate neighbor, fake neighbor vertices. So you have to be able to algorithmically reconstruct the surface you want to apply normals to. <clears throat> and he asked, well, can you apply that to a plane? And I thought, well, yeah. Uh, and I wanted, to do, I wanted to update our water shader anyway, so I thought I'd take an opportunity to do that and, and obviously use this effect to add some realism to the water. So let's take a look. We have here super complicated scene with a single unity plane hanging out here uh, and this by the way works a little bit better with higher vertex density but this is fine to illustrate so i have this deformer shader and it has a bunch of nice properties which i'll get into later i'm actually going to look at the shader in some detail later but let's look at the first thing we're going to increase the depth so we see our effect there we go so what we have is we see here's our x-axis going across this screen left to right so we see we have y-axis displacement running along the x-axis and this is just a single a <clears throat> simple sine wave right now there's there's more to the shader than that but um for right now with this just the depth being enabled that's all we have and so you notice a couple things so one thing here's the direction of the angle of the light the angle of the light you can see that's getting pretty close to parallel here which is why we're getting these uh these sort of drop-offs inside the uh you know on the surface and that's intentional that's so we can showcase a feature of the shader here in a moment uh, but anyway, so there, there's the effect. Now, one thing I want to mention about this is that the way the shader works is it does all the calculations in world space. So the local space position of the, of the verts doesn't matter. So one thing you can do, for instance, is rotate the object. And it's going to break up and look kind of stupid. But what's happening here is you can imagine that we have almost like it's like having a warped tabletop and we have a very thin rubber sheet and we can kind of push and we can like push it around, drag it around on the tabletop spin it, whatever, and it will track as well as it can that, that surface. Now, one thing to watch out for when you're doing stuff based on sine waves and all, and your vertex density isn't very high, you do get some ugly stuff. I mean, and there's, there's actually quite a few artifacts that are going to come up. This is one with, especially you end up with, sometimes you don't have enough verts to really show like all the cycles the sine wave is going through. It's kind of a Nyquist frequency problem. Um, this isn't that, this is just crap geometry problem, but the same thing will occur if it's on the axis and doesn't have enough data. Like, for instance, if I go over here and I turn the scale way up, you notice that there are times when the entire effect appears to sort of bottom out and then come back. Like, here we go, bottoms out and then comes back. And that's because at this point right here, every point is perfectly out of sync with the sine wave. So you're just not seeing that. So, so there are definitely some artifacts that you're going to run into as you, as you use the shader or use approaches like this. Um, if it's all based on trig effects like this one. So here goes an example of where it's just like totally bottoming out. I mean, there's lots of, this is basically phase disagreement where the mesh and the phase of the shader don't really align. If we take this back down, you see we get back to a nice, uh, nice agreeable sine wave effect. So more on that in a bit. I'm just going to undo all this craziness. Okay. Um, and then just in terms of making it look a little bit more realistic, you know, if we wanted to do like water or something this way, there is a little bit of a drift we can add on X and a drift we can add on Z. And if we reduce the depth considerably, actually I'm just going to go ahead and play the scene here so we can see the animated effect. So here it is. And let's, let's speed it up a little bit. So a little bit more motion there. There we go. So we'll increase the depth and we'll increase this sort of, you can see here the, the Z axis sine wave really cutting into it now, but we want to leave it out bring your depth down. Now you might wonder about these bands and can you do anything about the bands? Well, one thing I did add is the smoothing effect. And what this basically does is it, when it's constructing fake neighbors, uh, smoothing basically allows you to eliminate the y-axis delta. In other words, you're, you're flattening the polygon that you're gonna to use to calculate the surface normal. So as you increase the smoothing, actually if you jack it all the way up to, to one, you notice there's, there's no normal perturbation happening at all. This is if we weren't rebuilding normals on the surface. If you just sort of modify vertex data, you get this effect and it's not as good as it could be. If we slide this in a little bit, so, you know, so now we're not getting these big gaps, we're getting this nice kind of feathery effect. And this is very convincing for things like water or jellies or you know whatever it is you wanna use this for, pretty much anything. Um, 
things like that. So, you know, this could, I, I like this effect here. I'll maybe increase the x-axis a little bit and decrease the speed. And then maybe the depth a little bit. That's nice. The birds chirping in the background. It's very, very tranquil. <clears throat> all right, and then let's jack all these things back up so we can actually see what we're doing as we talk about the shader itself and how this thing works. So now the, the, the core, con before going any further, like the core concept that, that needs to be um, in place when you want to try and do something like this is reconstructing the surface. And this has nothing to do with that at all. Um, here is a, what was I looking at over here? Sorry, one second. Da, da, da. Oh, it was a problem with, uh, what looked like a problem with them all. I actually had two really weird bugs today. One was with CG sign too, where it just, it for whatever reason, when I was using CG sign to perturb the Y vertex, it was turning the whole thing into a tube, even though nothing was modifying X, Z coordinates. So there was no way to reposition a vertex on X, Z, but it was definitely rolling the surface into a tube. Beats me. Then I had a problem with mall. I, I think my computer was possessed. I, I did reset and everything's been fine since then. Um, anyways, so the core concept, when you're going to rebuild surface topology like this, if you're going to try and rebuild the normals, there are two concepts to keep in mind. So one, you're going to be, to rebuild a normal, you need neighbor data. You need to have a vertex and it needs to know about other vertices so that it knows what the surface orientation is at that point. And the way you get the normal from the surface orientation with the cross product. So here we see, this is from Wikipedia page. You know, cross product, if you have any questions about it, I strongly recommend going here. But as an illustration for what we're trying to do, this, this is a you know quick, horrible mock-up warning programmer art in Modo. Here's just a big triangle, and you can see I've highlighted the edges of the triangle here in red. And this blue thing here is what we want to, uh, to, you know, to arrive at as the surface normal uh, coming from this vertex. It's actually the vertex normal, but think of it as the surface normal. Just a reminder that you know what, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to build a polygon that tracks an ideal surface and generate a surface normal from its edges using the cross product. That's what this whole process is about. Okay, so code. Uh, this is the sign function that we're going to ignore. This is the vertex shader, and this down here is just, actually this isn't using a fragment, this is a regular all surface shader, but okay. Uh, so we come in, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to be working in world space. So we use this small object world to get a vertex that's in world space. And then we're going to do our, our neighbor sampling. Now, in the case of a plane, it's incredibly easy because your neighbors are just going to be elsewhere on the plane, on whatever axis it's along. Or, well, whatever plane it's along, I guess. You know, whatever axis is the normal to the plane. So in this case, Y up is pretty much the end of the story. That's one thing I'll, I, should, I should point out. Although this thing does track rotation on next Z, it also tracks rota rotation, um, I'm sorry, tracks rotation on Y. It also lets you rotate it on other axes, but then it's just going to apply the same effect uh, to all the verts, even though it's really basically exclusively a Y axis effect. So it's letting you do some things that really don't make any sense logically. Th this is definitely a top down uh, Y axis only xz plane effect and if you wanted it to affect something else this is where you would need to think about that in this case i'm just i'm putting another vertex is making up a neighbor i don't i don't really know what my this when i have a vertex i have no idea who its neighbors are no idea at all so we have to be able to reconstruct the surface and in the case of the other example the older example that was a unit sphere so it was basically you know just rotating a vector looking somewhere else knowing that it would always be on a unit sphere in this case, it's just going to move a little bit, and you notice it's a very tiny amount, in fact, on X and a very tiny amount on Z. So this will create a very small triangle on XZ. The trick to this is that each of these three samples has to be perturbed by some algorithm. You're going to write, you know, in this case, it's a wave function, but it could be whatever it's going to be. The trick is to make sure that your fake neighbors are perturbed in exactly the same way as every source sample so that they may as well be another source sample. And you just need to make sure that you're algorithmically able to place them somewhere where the surface actually exists. And again, a plane, it really doesn't get any simpler. You just look out on one axis and look out on the other axis of the plane where it's flat and there you go. For a sphere, again, you just rotate. I mean, it's, when you get into more complicated shapes, obviously it's more complicated, but it is definitely doable. There's a whole field of, um, you know, ISO prime surfaces and blobs and all that kind of stuff where, um, a, quite a lot of complicated surfaces can be reconstructed algorithmically. It's, it's a deep field. In this case, 
none of that. We're just we're looking out on X. We're looking out on on uh, Z. This is all really just a bunch of animation stuff. I mean, some and this, by the way, could be optimized uh, quite a bit. Um, it didn't really bother with that because it's not essential to demonstrating the effect. But these these second blocks here. This is really the important line. I mean, this is really just it. The, the second blocks. I'm just going to comment these out here for a second. These are adding that X drift and Z drift. You know, these are kind of making the effect more pleasing. But for just the basic effect, it's just on Y. We're going to perturb that by the sign of a, this big value, all this you know crazy stuff with speed and depth and scaling and all that. But really, all it is is it's the X coordinate. So this is why we have in the default case we have the uh, you know Y position being controlled by a sine wave, which is obviously running along the X axis. Well, here you go. That's because we're feeding it the world coordinate. Remember, we did our mall up here. This is the world space x coordinate, and that's what's driving the sine, and that's what's driving the y offset, and that's what's creating our perturbation. So we do that for this base sample, and for the first neighbor, which is its plus x, and the second neighbor, which is its plus z. Here's that smoothing term, which again, you can see all this is doing. As smoothing goes from 0 to 1, it just eliminates the, different, the distance on y to kind of create, to keep those, those craters from forming in the, in the basically the troughs of, of the surface that you're deforming. Um, and then we're going to do a cross product. This is this is what I was showing here. This is exactly just this thing here, where we have one edge, which is just this vertex minus this. This is our sample. Like this would be the location of the sample vertex. This is one neighbor. This is the other neighbor. We subtract this, you know, the core vertex from the neighbor vertex, and that gives us a vector pointing this way, a vector pointing this way, and that's going to give us the cross product of those two. Will give us the normal. Actually, I guess it technically this vector's pointing out. It'll give you the normal, but. Um, that's what we're doing here. Cross product, uh, you know, again, neighbor one minus the thing, the other neighbor minus the the uh, source vertex, and there you go. Uh, this this line basically, this is you know, there's a um, if you're looking at the shader, if you're looking at the project that this uh, comes with, you can add this uh, final color function show normals, which is just a little thing that will let you visualize this debug plug and probably put this back in. Actually, I'll show that in a moment too. Uh, and then you have to put the, the normals on. The thing is that the normals were calculated. Everything so far we've been doing, we've been doing in world space. But we want to put this back in object space now that we're done. So we do another mull to put our normals back in object space, we normalize them to make sure that they're you know, normals. And then we yet again have a third mull, or whatever, 27 mulls, uh, to put the vertex itself back in objects, which so is a little, you know, kind of wonky. But because it's using a surface shader, you actually want this back in vertex because the surface shader will automatically do the, you know, what normally would be your O pause calculation, the mull into the MVP uh, uh, model view projection matrix. That's going to be done by the surface shader by itself. So just put when you're done doing all the work in, in world space, and it's really helpful to work in world space because that's what gives you this kind of cool slidey sheet effect where you know it doesn't really matter where you put this thing which incidentally also means that um well i can't do i think actually maybe you can because it's all right yeah no that, that's not going to work exactly because they're sharing a mesh so you can't just go ahead and duplicate it but um uh, if you had multiple objects that weren't sharing a mesh the way plane does um you would be able to also just have them line up perfectly, as long as the, ge the edges line up, I and mean, as long as you don't have you know, a whole gap in the geometry, but as, as long as it's uh, solid, any number of objects obviously working in world space, there won't be any seams or gaps or whatever. So super handy. Just remember to put everything back in object space in your vertex shader when you're done. And that's basically it. I mean, that's, uh, you know, other than there's a lot of extra stuff being done here to make it look good, and there's a car alarm going off to make sure this video is as unprofessional as possible. Um, that is basically the, the, the concept. And one thing I guess I will show, I will show this, uh, the normals themselves. Although they're a little, I don't know if these are even going to show up on YouTube, because honestly they're a bit difficult to see. Maybe what I'll do is I won't range compress them, maybe that'll help. Uh, let's try that. Sort of. Eh, kind of. I'll demonstrate another feature. This this has a little rotator script, so I can have this kind of spin around as if by magic. Maybe we'll increase the depth a little bit. Well, I mean, you can see the normals. is not much to look at, to be honest. You can uh, see that they, they hold. You know, they're not going to spin around the object or anything. 
Um, and then, yeah, I mean, just in terms of actually using this now, what would you do with this practically? Well, again, this is really more than anything. It's kind of a water shader. Uh, let's go ahead and fix this. This target three, I think, I mean, I'm pretty sure you could optimize this and get this to work on, you know, uh, um, sort of older platforms. I mean, this, I would like eventually to see this work in Flash. Um, because we do have to think about flash support at least. I'm fairly certain you can do something like this on mobile. You can also, I mean, of course, you can always just break down. This stuff is actually so fast that you can just break down and do it all um, on the CPU as well, though that's, you know, obviously not not cool if you can avoid it. So yeah, looking at this again from the perspective of, you know, realistic, looking, looking useful, turn the depth down quite a bit, turn the smoothing up, uh, and then maybe add again some drift, some X and Z drift so it's not quite so flat and there we go that nice effect again uh, have the rotator on so that it's so you can see even though originally when we you know we weren't using any smoothing and we were using all this depth you know ugly ugly normal problems and blotches and all that kind of stuff but if you use this smoothing uh yeah even under these sort of less than ideal circumstances you can still get a convincing deformation effect without you know major artifacts and this is this is like perfect storm water. This is crazy. You would normally have this down quite a bit. Uh, maybe a little bit slower, who knows. So, yeah, uh, there you go. I don't know. Oh, another thing that's interesting. I didn't I'm not I haven't done the actual water part of this. Maybe I will eventually, but um since you you know the maximum offset in the form of this depth uh, which is one of the properties for the shader. You also know at any given time how close to the extreme of that depth range you are, which is obviously you could just you could add another uh, element to the struct um, and then take your current offset divided by the main offset, which would give you a range from zero to one, and you could use that to drive a foam layer in your surface or fragment shader, uh, which makes this, you know, it's not like a major feature. It's just kind of, it would be really easy to add that. Um, so, I mean, that's the, the, the core thing in this whole video and the core thing in this whole discussion about rebuilding surface normals is that you're probably going, oh, well, okay, you don't have to do it algorithmically. Now, the way I did it and what I was about to say is that the point of doing this is to do it algorithmically, is to keep in mind that you're trying to build polygons, basically, or, or like fake virtual triangles so you can get a surface normal. And the trick to doing that is knowing how to construct neighbor vertices algorithmically, like and again, in a plane, you just search along the dimensions of the plane. That's it. On a sphere, you rotate a vector, a unit vector, along the, the contour of the unit sphere. That's it. Um, for more complex objects, you, you will have to think more about it, but that's always the concept. The cross vector, the um, cross product vector is always what we're looking for. Now, it is possible that you could, um, you could bake uh, XYZ deflection from one vertex to a neighbor or even using some ex super exotic range compression um, do displacement to you know like in, in the RGBA channels of the vertex color you could store some data about where the neighbors should be when the object is at rest and then you can apply your deformation to that data so it is in fact possible to bake arbitrary uh, vertex deltas as long as you can somehow figure out how to store enough data in as many you know you've got rgba you've got uv2 to work with um technically that's six channels that gives you xyz offsets for two vertices which is all you need so even an arbitrarily complex mesh as long as you can reconstruct at least one triangle per input vertex which only takes two additional vertices if you used rgba and uv2 that's six channels. That means you can store XYZ offsets. I mean, they're going to be in 0 to 256 range, or, well, they're going to be in 0 to 1 range, but, of course, it's really half three data, you know, you're getting. So um, limited accuracy, but that is a way to bake completely arbitrary offsets into a mesh so that you actually do have uh, pointers to real-world neighbors, not just, you know, some algorithmic surface, not just a sphere, not just a plane, but an actual complex arbitrary mesh. Those deltas could be baked into those, those color channels and UV channels if you have enough um and you're and you're willing that's you know that obviously that that step isn't so hard it's doing something useful with that as perturbation that's not necessarily so simple um 
It's also true that, you know, this is reconstructing the normal, but you could also just modify the normal. I mean, you know, you could probably do something for something as simple as a plane. You could probably just bend the normal around with a sine wave and be done with that. You know, you don't have to measure it. But I thought it was worth demonstrating how to do it kind of the uh, reconstruction way since that was the, you know, topic. So, okay. I hope that's useful. Uh, maybe someone will go out and make awesome water, and I hope they do. Maybe they'll add the thing. I'm, I'm probably going to add the foam layer to this, too. Um, and we will speak again soon. Have fun, and thank you for watching.